Hi and welcome to my OCRA A-Level Biology Revision Session with me, Christine. So today's lesson I want to look at the principles of genetic engineering. So what is genetic engineering? Well, genetic engineering is carried out by a gene that's going to be transferred from one species to another species. So what's important for us to understand is that one, genetic code is universal and therefore the amino acid sequence of a polypeptide is going to remain the same. So because of that, we can, for example, move one gene into another organism, which therefore will result in the transcription and translation of that gene. And we've done that with producing, for example, golden rice, and also with the example of insulin for people who are diabetic. So let's look at how we do that. So the first thing that needs to happen is the gene that we are interested in can be isolated. Now it can be isolated using restriction endonucleases. So these are enzymes that are going to cut at a very specific recognition site. And when they cut at that recognition site, what they will do is they will allow for this isolated gene which has sticky ends. And those sticky ends are able to form hydrogen bonds with complementary base pairs. So as long as we use the same restriction endonucleases, we can create similar sticky ends. So that's one way where we take the gene we're interested in and we isolate it. Another way is where we actually isolate mRNA. Now, if we take mRNA and we then use an enzyme and that enzyme turns that mRNA into, first of all, a single-stranded copy complementary DNA, what will then happen is that will then work its way back and what we'll end up with using this enzyme which is called reverse transcriptase, it will make a complementary DNA strand. So we've started with our mRNA that's been isolated and then we've made this complementary DNA strand. So we are taking that copied code, the genetic code that has been copied onto mRNA, and we have then reversed that process to give us this double-stranded complementary DNA. So what would we need to do then? Well, we need to then transfer it into what's known as a vector. Now, bacterial plasmids are perfect vectors. They contain marker genes. Now, the marker genes that we're interested could be antibiotic genes, so an antibiotic resistant gene which is present in the bacterial cell, and it could be a fluorescent gene. So if we have these marker genes, what that will then mean is that we can use them to identify whether or not a plasmid has taken up our gene. So it's important to note that these bacterial plasmids are commonly used as vectors for genetic engineering because they are easily modified. We use restriction enzymes, endonucleases, to cut open the plasmids at specific base sequence. And what we therefore do is again we result in having these sticky ends. And what we can then do is we can easily modify that to include the extra genes that will therefore result in the production of new proteins. So let's just look at this as a whole. We have our plasmid, which we have taken from the bacterium. We have isolated the gene either by using restriction endonucleases alone or by isolating the mRNA and treating it with reverse transcriptase to make the complementary DNA. So it's important to note what it says in the question that they have given you. Once you have isolated the gene and the plasmid, you will use restriction endonucleases to ensure that they are cut open at exactly the same base sequence so that the sticky ends are the same. We want complementary base pairing to occur at what we call these sticky ends. And what we can then do 
is we can then take that plasmid, we can take that complementary DNA and we can fuse them together using DNA ligase. So what the DNA ligase will do is it will form the phosphodiester bonds between the backbone of the plasmid and the complementary DNA, which results in them fusing together. And then what we need to do is we have what's known as a recombinant plasmid. And what we're going to do is introduce that recombinant because it's different from the original. We've added in a gene. We're going to introduce this into a host cell. Now we introduce it through a process called electroporation. Now electroporation is where there are small electrical currents which are applied to make the membrane porous. Now, this can also be used to get a DNA fragment directly into a eukaryotic cell. So electroporation is small electrical currents which are applied, making the membrane porous so that that plasmid, this really small circular bit of DNA, this recombinated one with a different gene, is able to be inserted into that bacterial cell. Now remember we wanted a marker gene on it. We wanted the marker gene one which was a antibiotic resistant gene and one which was a fluorescent gene. And what we can do then is grow the bacteria on an antibiotic medium. By doing that, we can ensure that we are killing any of the bacterial cells which are not carrying the recombinated plasmid and then we allow them to multiply in a fermenter. And the fermenter side of things you will learn about when you look at the cloning and biotechnology topic area. So do check out my video on that one. But the key thing here is that we are ensuring that we're only going to multiply the one which is containing the recombinant plasmid in our fermenter. And what we want to happen is we want that therefore to start to produce the protein. In this case, it could be insulin. And what we will need to do is we will then separate and purify that insulin to then bottle it up and give it to the patients who require it. So this is one form in which genetic engineering results in the production of a protein which is necessary to help a person who has got type 1 diabetes. Now, it's important to note that there are ways in which you can do this in plants exactly the same in the fact that we take the desired gene, can be inserted into a plasmid with those markers that is then carried directly to plant DNA. Now, there is another way in which we can get the recombinated plasmid into the plant cells and that's through a process called electrofusion. Now if they want to talk about electrofusion they will give you a bit more information in the stem of the question but it basically is where you're going to again use electrical currents and this time it causes membranes to fuse together forming a hybrid. Now this results in polyploidy which is really hard to do in animal cells because the membrane isn't as stable and therefore this tends to only really work with plants. Once we have this hybrid, what we can then do is we can form callus and that callus will then divide by mitosis and make clones of the plant. So again, I will talk about this in more detail when I look at the cloning and biotechnology topic area. But it is important that you note that it is a way in which we can fuse, genetically modify organisms. Now we can do electrical fusion with animals, but we only tend to talk about that in the production of monoclonal antibodies. So if you remember when we looked at using the monoclonal antibodies for identifying excretory products in urine, we have an antigen that is injected into a mouse. We therefore want to remove those plasma cells that are specific to that antigen and then we fuse them with a tumor cell. Now what we can then do is we can create a hybridoma, that hybridoma will then produce the monoclonal antibodies. Well, when we look at the plant and the production of a 
genetically modified organism, what we tend to do is we tend to use a bacterial plasmid, which is from an organism that multiplies and creates tumors. So we tend to talk about the BT gene, and that is a way in which we can insert that into organisms, plants, which are therefore going to prevent pests from feeding on them. So the BT gene is a protein which is a toxin to animals that feed on it and that therefore can result in us producing in a pest resistant plant which then increases the food production for the growing population. So it's important you do know some examples and one of the examples you should know about is the GM pathogens, so genetically modified pathogens. Now this is a real problem, that if we were genetically modifying pathogens and they were able to get out into the general population, that could cause a problem in widespread diseases. So therefore, genetically modified pathogens can be produced, however, it only happens under strict regulations and it's only for research purposes if they're trying to find for example a way in which they can cure a disease or prevent a outbreak from occurring. Now the other thing you need to know is about painting and technology issues. Now this one relates to this genetically modified insect resistant seed so BT gene for example, with farmers with soy. Now, there is a problem with painting it and techno technology issues in the fact that farmers, if it's been patented, what that therefore means is that no one else can produce it the same way. So therefore, farmers can only buy their seeds and grow them from the company that they have actually patented the seeds. So the farmers buy their seeds, they grow them, but only in the year that they buy them. So they're not allowed to stock buy them, store them, and then later on grow them in other years. There is a rule that if the farmer has bought the seed, they must grow them in the first year from when they bought them. Therefore, that means that they have to go back again and again and again. And that therefore means that any farmers who don't have the capacity to keep going back and buying new seeds are therefore losing out in the opportunity to grow these seeds. So this becomes a bit of a problem. The other thing to know is with golden rice and golden rice is a way in which we have incorporated a vitamin which is very necessary for poorer countries and unfortunately with the painting technology issues, we are stopping farmers from growing golden rice and therefore preventing the population from being provided with nutritious food sources. The other example you need to know is about farming. So GM animals are there and can be used to produce pharmaceuticals. So we have had examples where we have what's known as the knockout mice, where genes have been deleted so they are able to more likely develop cancer. So they take these mice, they delete these genes and those mice are then going to develop cancer. Now this acts as a model for the new development of therapies. Is that the right way to do it? Is that not? And this is where farming and the ethical issues need to be considered. If we know that human genes and promoter sequences can be inserted into, for example, fertilized eggs of cows, sheep, or goats, then what we can see is that the gene is only expressed in the mammary glands. Therefore, we can then remove the desired protein and it harvested. So if we take a human gene and a promoter sequence and insert it into one of these fertilized egg cells, we are then ensuring that those mammary glands are going to produce that desired protein that we will then harvest and that will then be used to help the growing population. So we need to always consider the benefits and the harmful effects of genetic modification. So 
a lot of the times they'll give you some information that you need to pull the benefits out from and the harmful effects. But here are some standard ones. Obviously, a higher crop yield, more food, less damage, less effect on the ecosystem. Less land is going to need to be used if we are increasing the genetically modified organisms. We are therefore conserving our wildlife. And obviously less use of insecticide sprays if we are using, for example, plants which have had the pesticide resistant gene inserted into them. So it's expensive and can be harmful to farmers and wildlife if you have to use insecticide sprays. So by having less use of those insecticide sprays, you're making it less expensive. So it's really important if you want to give an answer about the expense that you are specific in how it is less expensive. So if you've got less use of insecticide sprays, you therefore don't need to train your staff to know how to use the insecticide sprays. You don't have to pay for the sprays and therefore it is less harmful to the farmers and the wildlife. On the flip side, if we're looking at the harmful effects, obviously we have the spread of the gene to wild plants. We have genetically modified one plant. Well, cross-pollination could result in that gene spreading to those wild plants. We could end up killing the non-pests. So pollen containing the toxin could be blown onto the wild plants and then those insects are going to feed on those wild plants. So a prime example of this is the monarch butterfly caterpillars and they then are eating the toxins in the pollen and that could kill an organism that wasn't intended to be killed. So this is a negative and that harmful effect. The other thing to think about is obviously when we look at the nutrient cycle within the ecosystems, detritivores could feed on material containing those toxins that therefore again is killing non-pest um, species. And the other thing is resistance in the pest. If you have random mutations, those random mutations could result in that gene that was producing the toxic proteins. Those toxic proteins are no longer toxic and therefore we now have resistance in these pests. So it's important that you argue both for and against, against. And it's also important to look at the question that they have given you when it says evaluate, that you are always giving arguments for and against. So I hope you've liked this video. And if you have, then please click on the like button and subscribe to my channel. Also do check out my revision platform, www.eiqchat.com.